It does not merely change a function by degree, but by kind. It renders behavior more predictable, more stereotyped. Armoring puts life in constraint. Armoring is most often revealed in muscular tension, but it is also revealed in eyes that are glazed, in excessive body fat, and so forth. It is a dynamic event, and it entails consumption of energy. It constrains us physically, emotionally, and ideationally. It is a cocoon to which we gradually become accustomed. Reich viewed all living systems as pulsatile. In the mammal, there are many individual pulsations encompassed within the overall pulse of charge with energy and discharge of energy. There is the heart's pulse, the lung's pulse, the gastrointestinal pulse, the brain's pulse, and so forth. Armoring narrows the pulsation from aliveness to all aspects of his existence to, in the worst case, living at a level of mere existence. The heavily armored individual fears expansion and pleasure gives him anxiety. Armoring blocks the flow of natural impulses and bends them to a new purpose, just as light is bent when it hits glass or water, so armoring bends impulses that come from our core and change them into another direction. For example, the natural aggression of a child whose parents cannot tolerate that aggression and punish him for it, turns when he armors from that punishment, turns into anger, hatred, sneakiness, or other manifestations which Reich called the secondary manifestations. And these are covered over by what Reich called the superficial layer, that is the layer that meets society. And therefore, the secondary layer might be covered over by compliance, by politeness, by characterological rigidity, or other kinds of cover-ups. Thus, the organomist views personality not in terms of id, ego, and superego, but in terms of core impulses, secondary layer, and superficial layer. And in our therapy, we treat patients going in the opposite direction. We start with treating character as it's revealed in the superficial layer. When we reveal that and uncover that, we get to the manifestations of the secondary layer. And if we can manage to unburden the individual of the secondary layer impulses, we finally arrive at the core, at the 
natural man. Now I'm just going to give you some very brief anecdotes of what you might witness in our office. Um, a patient whose history I've taken, whose complaints I have listened to, for the first time I put him on the couch. And I say, I want you to breathe this way. Take a long, full breath in and just let go. And just keep breathing that way. So he lies on the couch and he starts. And he does this for maybe five minutes. And then suddenly he starts to laugh and he tries to stop his laughter and he starts to laugh even more and he says what the hell am I laughing at and as soon as he asks the question he bursts out laughing even more and the whole rest of the hour is consumed with him laughing trying to stop the laughter bursting into laughter again and stopping it and at the end he says what the hell was that he says, but I'll tell you, I feel better. The second patient is a patient in a brief psychotic episode. She has been referred by one of our trainees in organomy, who is a psychiatric resident at a local hospital. And he has referred her to me because he knows that she's much too much for him to handle. Her story is that her husband, who is a physician, left suddenly with his secretary and all their money and left her with two children. And she quickly went into a, a psychotic episode for the first time in her life. Now, interestingly, her twin sister has been psychotic all of her life. She comes into my office and she is very clearly disoriented. And she keeps asking me, are you Dr. X, that is the doctor who referred her? And I say, no, I am Dr. Herskowitz. And every five minutes she says, are you Dr. X? And I say, no, I am Dr. Herskowitz. And then she says, are you going to hurt me or do something bad to me? And I reassure her, no, I'm not going to hurt you or do anything bad to you. And then she says, can I look in your mouth? And I say, okay, and I open my mouth, and she examines my mouth. And then when she is reassured that I'm not going to swallow her, we begin to work. And I say, follow this flashlight. And I move a flashlight in random movements in front of her eyes and at first she has difficulty following the light but eventually she follows it and then I say she's lying supine and then I say there are four objects one object this wall this wall this wall this wall behind you without moving your head just move your eyes and try to see each of those objects and she tries to, to do that exercise and then I say now just make your eyes soft and look into my eyes and she does and we do those three things following the light looking at objects in the room and looking at me and at the end of the hour she takes my hand and she says that was good Now what I have worked on in each of those patients is one segment of armoring. Reich said that there are seven segments of armoring. And each of these segments is capable of its own emotional function, though practically several segments work together to express an emotion. 
For example, though the eye segment can express its own emotions, very often it works in conjunction with other segments. If one expresses anger, one not only looks angry, but clenches one's jaw, clenches one's fist, etc. So very often in emotional expression, several excuse me, segments are working